Sports have an interesting way of going about telling the tale of their seemingly superhuman talents. They can show up an athlete's ability to do the unthinkable and the unfathomable for years and years on end, but they can also expose man's weakness of being a temporary beast. Victories and success can flood one's career, but it doesn't last long, and this holds true in NASCAR. Richard Petty was great in an era where he was destined to be great. The 1960s and the 1970s saw him flat out dominate the competition, but as soon as he stepped out of his era into the 1980s and 1990s, goals stopped washing down the river. This phenomenon holds true for every driver in NASCAR. Every driver has their moments, their races, their years, and their decades. And so in this series, we'll talk about the best to do in each era, in each decade of this time-old tradition we call stock car racing. I'll be taking a look at the top 10 drivers in the 1950s in this video. We'll lump 1949 into the 50s for convenience's sake. Here for the next couple of months, we'll talk about the top 10 drivers of each era, from the 1950s all the way until the 2010s. So, without further ado, let's roll out my list as to who the best of NASCAR's pioneer era was. In 10th, I have none other than Jack Smith. Smith was born in Metropolis, Illinois, a hotspot for some of the earliest bootleggers of the Roaring Twenties. His father owned an auto body shop, and Jack worked there after school, pounding the fenders of flathead Fords and listening to his stories of automobile racing. This stirred his appetite to get behind the wheel of a car and go out and race. On weekends, he went door-to-door -door against prominent bootleggers on fields and homemade tracks when his parents weren't looking. Over time, Smith would build a bit of a reputation for himself as an amateur racer. In 1949, he learned about a new organization named NASCAR and showed up to race at its very first Strictly Stock event, a 150-mile showdown at the old dirt track Charlotte Speedway in mid-June. He finished a very respectable 13th, and over the next seven years, he would turn out to be a pretty consistent racer that may not have been an eye-popping talent, but certainly one that kept his nose clean and still raced hard. In 1956, Jack earned his first NASCAR victory in Martinsville, and by the next season, he expanded his victories to four races. Several more victories would ensue, and he'd even win NASCAR's most popular driver award in 1959. While he trickled down the number of races run in the 1960s, his talents were well seen across NASCAR fandom at the time, and the fact they aren't talked about much today is a bit of a travesty in my opinion. He racked up 21 total wins in his career, and in the 1950s, he scored 11 wins, which rank him 10th amongst the drivers on this list. In 9th, we have a name that might surprise many, the winningest driver to never win a championship at NASCAR, none other than Junior Johnson. Johnson was born in Rhonda, North Carolina. Their family was involved in the whiskey business way before he was even born. His father was a lifelong bootlegger and spent nearly 20 of his 63 years in prison as her house was frequently raided by revenue agents. Junior was arrested and spent one year in prison in Ohio in the mid-50s for having an illegal still, though usually he always stayed above law enforcement. 1955 saw Johnson begin his career as a NASCAR driver. In his first full season, he won five races and finished sixth in the points. The next year, he won six races, and then the year after that, he won five races. A short track ace that gave everyone around him a run for their money, Johnson was one of the most highly regarded independents of that time, and a fan favorite amongst many. While the 1950s only saw him record 16 wins of what would eventually rack up to be 50 in total, it did set the stage for his dominance in the early to mid-60s, and it imprinted himself in the world of NASCAR as a face you were going to have to get used to seeing in Victory Lane Weekly. Next up the ladder in 8th, we have Alfred Bruce Thompson. It's not certain how or when Thompson earned his famous nickname Speedy, but it more than complemented his on-track performance. Born in Union County, North Carolina in 1926, Thompson's father was involved in the racing scene as a car owner, even once offering Tim Flock a ride for him while Alfred was growing up. He also had a welding shop where Speedy worked as a kid until he was employed in the draft in 1942. While not much is known about Speedy for the rest of the 1940s, his appetite for racing was evidently stirred as he began racing in 1950. He made his NASCAR Cup debut at the Vernon Fairgrounds, driving for his father, ultimately finishing 21st in the field of 29 cars. Things didn't fare much better in 1951. At the season opener at Daytona Beach, he finished 17th, and at the next race at Charlotte, it didn't go well either. However, at the 17th round at Weaverville, he was able to finish 5th in his 1951 Studebaker and earned $200 for his efforts. Despite this impressive result, he only ran two races in 1952, which was the same song as the first two races the previous year, just a different verse. However, he finally broke through in 1953, increasing involvement to seven races and winning two. While he would go winless in 1954, he scored two wins and then again in 1955 and in 1956, he entered the peak of his racing career, which lasted up until 1959. In this stretch, he scored 14 wins and finished third in points in these four consecutive seasons. While he was never the top driver in any season of competition, and while he quickly dwindled away into the pages of history after the 1950s, he still showed everybody what kind of talent he had, and proved to many fans then that he knows how to hold a pretty wheel. In seventh, we have Truman Fontello Flock, nicknamed Fonty. An intelligent, well-spoken, and enthusiastic character in the ranks of NASCAR, Flock made quite the name for himself during NASCAR's pioneer era, helping NASCAR make quite the name for itself as well. 
He was one of the first drivers to embrace forms of media as a means of connecting with the fans and growing NASCAR as a brand. This is the famous team of the Bot Brothers. I guess you'd call us famous. Well, I, that's what I hear. They tell me you're a pretty famous outfit. Thank you, sir. This is what? Rob and Tim. And Bonnie. Bonnie. That's right. Uh, they tell me that this whole family of flocks is a great uh, bunch of racers and uh, busy in all kinds of things that furnishes people with thrills. Is that right? Well, we try to, yes, sir. How long have you been in the racing business, uh, Monty? Uh, since 1938. And what have you been doing in that time? Just racing stock cars, and I uh, have race, race cars, but not very much. I see. Well, uh, didn't you win some titles in the uh, NASCAR races? In 1947, I won the NASCAR championship. In 48, I was second. 49, I won the championship again. And in 1951, I was second. Well, you've done pretty well, I'd say, during that time. Yes. This would certainly draw some much-needed eyeballs into the Southern sport. Born in 1920 in Alabama, Flock showed an interest in racing from a young age. As a teenager, he owned his talents on dirt tracks under the tutelage of his older brother Bob Flock. On the side, he also delivered illegal moonshine, sometimes seeking out the cops just to feel the thrill of the chase. By 1941, Fonte was regarded as one of stock car racing's best drivers, and this rapid ascent to racing stardom eventually took him to Bill France's touring series. During the early 40s, Flock would serve in the Air Corps, but after this stint, he was eager to get back behind the wheel of a race car. He convinced a car owner by the name of Ed Schneck to put him in his race car for an event in North Wilkesboro in 1947, and despite not racing for nearly half a decade up until this point, he won the pole, the heat race, and the feature. Later that year, he was crowned the champion of the 1947 National Championship Stock Car Circuit, a predecessor to NASCAR. In 1948, he finished second in the standings, and in 1949, he won the Modifieds title. During the first three years France conducted modified races, Flock won 34 races and a few more than 100 starts. By 1951, Flock expressed an interest in racing in Cup for a majority race schedule, making a bid for the championship, which is precisely what he would do that very year. And in his first season running most of the races, he finished second in points. He finished fourth and fifth in points the next two seasons, scoring six wins to add to his nine. However, despite these strong runs, he scaled back his effort for 1954, never running for a championship again. Still, he would have flashes of brilliance on an occasional run. In 1955, he scored three wins, and in 1956, he scored one win. Gradually, the number of races he ran decreased. In fact, in 1956, he only ran seven races. For 1957, it was looking to be more of the same. He would make a start at Daytona Beach, finishing third, only did not run again until the end of the season at Darlington. This opportunity to race at the Southern 500 came after Herb Thomas had been gravely injured in a 1956 race held at the Cleveland County Fairgrounds. In this race, on lap 27, Fonny Flock would spin out, being smashed by Bobby Myers and Paul Goldsmith in the process, injuring all and killing Myers. From the hospital bed, Flock announced his retirement. Six seats yet another familiar face in Curtis Turner. By now, most know Turner's story and rise to NASCAR prominence. He was born in Floyd, Virginia to Morton and Minnie Turner on April 12, 1924. Curtis grew up with a brother and two sisters. His father, Morton Turner, was into the moonshine business and had a productive still. Curtis was responsible for delivering his father's moonshine to the customers. A moonshiner from a very early age and a man notorious for finding crafty and creative ways to stay above the law, he laid the foundation for his mischievous manners that made him a peculiarly popular character in the formative years of NASCAR. Turner would garner 16 wins in the 1950s in NASCAR, and while most of the famous tales of him would come out of a different decade, the 1950s showcased what kind of talent he was. Not only did the man put many butts and seats and cheers in many vocal cords, but he gave the roar and applause from many something to continue to roar and applaud about. The thing I find the most intriguing about Turner wasn't his off-track antics so much as his on-track antics. He'd pop you out of the way faster than you can process it, and his wins didn't just come off some bonsai move in the last corner or some last lap Hail Mary pass. No, they came off sheer domination, and if you lost to Turner, you knew you'd just gotten beat off plain speed. Out of every race he led the most laps, he only lost two of them. That's mighty impressive. Glenn Roberts Jr. is next up as we approach over the top five's territory. Known by many for his well-dressed manner, big friendly grin, and attitude, Roberts got his fair share of accolades on the Grand National Circuit. Born in Florida in 1929, Glenn initially expressed immense passion for America's favorite sport, baseball. He was so good at it and made such a knack for his fastball that he quickly earned the nickname Fireball, and this nickname stuck well into his racing career. Fireball Roberts' love for racing started when he was 18. He begged his mother to consent to racing, which she begrudgingly agreed to. While in college, Fireball raced on the weekends at his local dirt tracks in Daytona Beach or Jacksonville. After three years at the University of Florida, Roberts shifted his focus into pursuing a full-fledged career in auto racing. The 1950s would see Roberts make a name for himself, netting 20 wins and a best points finish of second, which happened in his rookie year. While the next decade saw triumph quickly transition into tragedy, Roberts' talents and charisma are fondly remembered by many alike. Narrowly missing out on the podium is the youngest Flock brother, Defonte, Bob and their sister Ethel, Julius Timothy Flock. 
Despite being the last to strap behind the wheel in his family, he's easily the best in it. With 39 wins in the 1950s, as well as two championships and a modified championship in 1949, this Hall of Famer had quite the career in NASCAR. Flock's talents from his first season in NASCAR in their first year, where he took an Oldsmobile from his newlywed neighbors, to 1955 where he scored 18 wins, the most in the season, until Richard Petty broke that record in 1967, right up until his last in the early 1960s, showcased the kind of talent he had. He's also best known for having a rhesus monkey as his passenger for two weeks, named Jocko Flocko. With the win at Hickory in 1953, Jocko became the first and so far only monkey to ever win a NASCAR event. Before we get to the podium, let's take a look at four honorable mentions who narrowly missed out on making this list. Open wheel racer turned stock car driver Dick Rathman narrowly missed out on the top 10 list. He did score 9 wins in the 1950s, with the best points finish of 3rd in 1953, so he definitely deserves a mention at the very least. Another 9-time winner in this decade is Bob Wellborn. While most of his wins came at the end of this decade, while most of his claim to fame came in the convertible division, where he won 3 championships, he did show off some talent with the best points finish of 4th in 1955. Marshall Teague would finish off the 1950s with 7 wins, despite only running from 1949 to 1952 sparingly. And Marvin Panch would too, having quite a decade, which saw him nearly take home the big trophy in 1957 over Buck Baker. Speaking of Baker, he's the driver taking home bronze today. But while it's bronze today, in the 1950s, Baker saw his fair share of gold. Born in the spring of 1919 in Richburg, South Carolina, LZ Wiley Baker didn't grow up racing on the weekend or hauling moonshine like some of his competitors in the 1950s. In fact, he was a bus driver in the late 1930s, and it wasn't until he was 20 years old that he attended his first stock car race. He instantly fell in love with the art of bending one's fender, and figured he could pursue a career as a driver because he had been one most of his life. While he was scared to the bone in his first go at racing at a short track in Greenville, South Carolina, it wouldn't scare away Buck completely. After racing modifieds for the next few years and doing it in a successful fashion, he started his Cup Series journey beginning in 1949. What would ensue for the next 10 years is 39 wins, highlighted by 1953 Southern 500 win. He also won two championships in 1956 and 1957, becoming the first driver to win consecutive Cup titles. However, while Baker was a notable frontrunner in NASCAR's early years and spurred the attention of anyone around him, he had to often overcome the formidable talents of the next two drivers on this list, one of them being Herbert Watson Thomas. Thomas and the next man on this list are tied for the most wins in the 1950s, but Herb in particular had two seasons that inflated that just a bit, but we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. Herb was born in the spring of 1923 in Olivia, North Carolina. Thomas worked as a farmer growing up before he turned his attention to racing automobiles in the 1940s. The tail end of that decade would seem begin to make his run as the king of the 1950s. While he won 48 times in the 50s, those were the only 48 wins of his entire career. His first win happened in 1950 and his last in 1956. After that, he never won again. 1953 and 1954 saw him win 12 times, which inflate his statistics just a bit. The next man on this list won in every single season of the decade. Thus, Herb Thomas will have to settle for second, and Lee Petty will claim first. Petty was born near Randleman, North Carolina on March 14, 1914. Early in life, Petty did anything he could just to foot a bill, working on the farm, being a taxi driver, and even repairing cars. It wasn't until NASCAR's first season in 1949 where 35-year-old Lee Petty strapped behind the wheel of a stock car for the first time in his life. Despite no prior experience or knowledge before the Charlotte Speedway race in 1949, Petty finished a solid 17th for Gilmer Good. After that, he and his family began making the cars themselves, thus forming Petty Enterprises. One might think that their performance would teeter-totter off, but quite the contrary. The next five races he ran would see him finish in the top 10 in all of them, and even score a win. This would set the tone for the rest of the decade. What would ensue is 48 wins, 3 championships, and a Daytona 500. Petty was one of the first drivers to make a career out of driving race cars, which would influence the sports athletes as a whole. Despite his on-track antics for bumping and shoving his competition, everyone could see what he had in his hands to grip the wheel. I honestly wonder how many more accolades Lee would have racked up had he started racing 10 years earlier and had the sport been founded 10 years earlier as well. Perhaps there's an answer to that inquiry, an answer found deep in his DNA and passed on to the next generation. And in the next video, we'll dive deep into that answer. The 1950s were the pioneer era in NASCAR, and despite the lack of on-track footage and the overall lack of records from particular events, it was an interesting era to say the least. It set the stage for what NASCAR would become and what the 1960s would bode. I certainly hope you all found some of the stars and stories of this decade interesting. So, until next time, this has been the news, I'll see ya.